Welcome back. I hope you're having a nice time. First up here is Rob Myas, who, um, well, it's funny. You know, when you pull these things together, people pitch in with suggestions. And about a month and a half ago, uh, Paul McGee, who's one of the Flying Karamazovs and is speaking in the last session, oh, there you go, another hometown favorite. He said, hey, Mike, I just ran into this guy who's like the world authority on bats. Do you need somebody to come and talk about bats? And I said, well, you know, we've already got one. Um, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rob, if you need the lights to be brought down a little bit to make your friends comfortable, you, you just tell everybody, because we've got a, uh, more than just Rob here. Rob Myas from the Bat Conservation Organization. Thank you. Everybody. All right, so obviously you already told everybody, but I'm here to talk about bats. Bats? Oh, I don't have a clicker. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Okay, start me over on time. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> that was a 30-second fumble. <laughs> Thank you. Bats uh, made Batman cool. Bats <laughs> pollinate food that we love, like bananas, and bats protect our food uh, from bugs. My name is Rob Myas. I'm the executive director and founder of the Organization for Bat Conservation. The organization is uh, partnered and uh, is located at Cranbrook Institute of Science, just north of Detroit, a couple thousand miles from here. I travel all over the country teaching people about how interesting bats are inspiring people to actively participate in bat conservation. I'm also a scientist of over 20 years, and I'm an author of several different books, including uh, most recently, Bats A to Z, a great book written by my wife, Ava, who you'll meet in a minute. I love bats. <laughs> bats are amazing animals. They're the only mammal in the world that can fly, ever, in the past or probably in, even into the future. They come in so many different shapes and sizes from the smallest bat in the world, the hog-nosed bat from Thailand, only weighing two grams, as much as a dime. That's the smallest mammal in the world, it's a bat. To the biggest bat in the world, with a six-foot wingspan, weighing three pounds from Malaysia, and all different sizes in between. Over 1,300 different kinds of bats in the world. And I'm here to tell you that they are going extinct. Bats are dying off in huge numbers. And after this presentation, you are gonna be so moved, you are gonna go home and you're going to create bat habitat. You're gonna put up a bat house. Bat houses give bats a safe place to live. If you don't like bats, they give, somewhere, they give bats somewhere else to live than your attic or behind your shutters or in your garage. You're going to want to go home and plant wildflower gardens if you don't have them already or in your city park or your neighborhood to give bats something to eat. And you're going to want to teach your friends not only that bats are cool, but that bats are economically and ecologically important to us. The way that bats find their food is by using ultrasonic sounds. High-pitched ultrasonic sounds made with their vocal cords. They give off the sounds. It's called echolocation. They give off their sounds. It bounces off of things, and they know where everything is in pitch darkness. They can tell a single strand of hair just by listening to their echo. Echolocation. Bats aren't blind. They can see. Bats aren't going to get stuck in your hair. Bats aren't going to drink your blood. We're not even going to talk about the myths because those are too silly. Farmers save billions of dollars annually just in the United States because bats exist. We depend on bats for eating large numbers of moths and beetles that destroy our crops. Let's take a look at this bat eating up close. Bat. At the Organization for Bat Conservation, we get a lot of injured bats in. This People is a live, can you see this okay? This is a live mealworm. You want that mealworm? Oh! There we go. Oh. Oh, that is... Oh. <laughs> wow. That is 
is really adorable. <laughs> I have a feeling he was being facetious, but city boy, a little nervous around the bats. Um, we depend on bats to protect our food. We depend on bats to pollinate plants. Who here likes guacamole? Guacamole. Bats pollinate avocados. Who here likes bananas? Bats pollinate bananas. Who likes tequila? That's right, I know it. All right, bats are the only pollinators of agave that we make tequila from. We depend on bats for pollination. We depend on bats to plant seeds in the rainforests. Tropical fruit bats spread seeds of fruit that we love like mangoes, pineapple, and fig. Delicious food that else also keeps us healthy. So bats keep us healthy. They eat tons of insects, they pollinate plants, and they spread seeds, and they do it all for free. Bats not only keep us healthy, but they save us a lot of money. And unfortunately, though, as I alluded to at the beginning, bats are dying off. They're in the worst shape they've ever been in North America in history. I've been studying bats for over 20 years and never expected bat populations to be this low. Uh, a lot of it has to do with our activities. And one of it, it's kind of surprising, is monocultures. It's single crop agriculture, first off, is decimating habitat and it's causing a lot of obviously pollution, but pesticides, because when you grow one crop, it's hard to keep everything off of it. And pesticides obviously kill off the insects that bats eat and that other things eat, and makes it unhealthy for animals to breathe. Overconsumption, waste. This is a picture taken last year um, in Brooklyn on, uh, on uh, one of the beaches. Bats are having a hard time finding healthy food, healthy water, and they're also finding a hard time finding places to live. This is taken from a plane coming into LA. Overpopulation, urban sprawl, these activities are greatly affecting bats, and not just bats, but birds, bees, butterflies are dying off as well. I bet a lot of you've heard that bees are dying off, and we should care. 30% of the food that lands on your plate was pollinated by bees. Bees make a big difference. But I bet you a lot of you didn't know that monarch butterflies are, are, are becoming closely endangered. Hundreds of millions of monarch butter, butterflies would fly down to Mexico for the winter. And now, over, over the last couple of years, only several million butterflies have made it. And that's because they're dying from the same reasons. Lack of healthy places to live, healthy things to eat, and especially pollution and waste are causing big problems. I'm not the only one talking about bats. Major media outlets are also talking about how bats are critical to a healthy ecosystem. They're critical to our health. U.S. farmers are saving upwards of $53 billion annually just from the, uh, from the insects that bats eat. They don't have to control those insects. All right, so what if bats disappear? That's what people ask me all the time. What if bats disappear? All right, I love bats, so I would be crushed. But really, for the rest of people, what would happen? We'd have a lot more insects? No, we'd have a lot more pesticides. So farmers, we can control the insects. We just spray a lot more pesticides. That's really bad. Pesticides cause disease. Pesticides, that's bad for us. It's terrible for smaller things. Even the president and the first lady recognize the importance of bats. We were recently invited to the White House for the 137th Easter egg roll. I don't know if you've ever been to that. 35,000 people in 10 hours. It was 40 degrees at 4.30 in the morning when we had to show up. It was really cold, but eventually it got nice and warm. There was yoga on the South Lawn. There was um, Michelle Obama dancing. It was amazing. We were partnering with the Forest Service and the USDA to talk about healthy living, healthy food. And what we need for healthy food is healthy pollinators. And so things like bees, butterflies, bats we were talking about. And the message that bats were important to our health was so well received at the after this event, 
there's now a bathhouse being put up in the first lady's garden. That's how excited people are about baths. That's what you're going to end up doing as well. I told you right from the beginning, you're going to end up doing that too. We've got some new friends that are helping us teach about baths. Hi, I'm Ben Affleck, and I want to talk to you about one of my favorite species of animals, the bat. We're at the Bat Zone at Cranbrook Institute of Science, headquarters of the Organization for Bat Conservation. We are in one of our enclosures, checking out some of the biggest bats and some of the smallest bats that are here at the Bat Zone. Bats keep the planet healthy. Bats eat millions of bugs every night. Because bats eat bugs, farmers can use less pesticide on their food. This really big bat right here is Tom, and Tom is a Malayan flying fox. It's the largest bat species in the entire world. The little bat is called an evening bat. One of the biggest problems in North America is that insect-eating bats are dying because of a fungus. And unfortunately, it grows on bats while they hibernate during the winter. Millions of bats are dying each year. So far, a disease called white nose syndrome has killed about six million bats in North America. Essentially, these bats are on the verge of completely dying out. Not only would we lose an extraordinary species, the death of our bats would be catastrophic to our ecosystem. There was just this little blurb in the news I saw about bats getting this thing called white nose fungus. I think that we all just take for granted that there's bats and bats are going to be fine. But then as we started doing the research, we actually found that the bats are in a dire straits actually. As a movie that benefits from the bats, we thought we're going to build these bat habitats as a way to raise awareness and just generally let's learn about bats and know how they benefit us because they're really important. Bat houses give healthy bats a safe place to raise their babies and that gives bats a fighting chance to repopulate. Plus, putting up a bat house is a fun thing to do with kids. It is a fun thing to do with kids. That was one of my kids. <laughs> a couple of them. There was a few of my kids in there. Um, so, the, so the problem is huge. The problem really is big, but we can do something. We can do something in our backyards. You can do something to help bats out by creating habitat for bats. Again, it gives them an alternative so they don't live in your attic or behind your shutters or in your barn. So putting up a bat house gives a safe, warm, dry place for moms to raise their babies. They usually have one baby once a year. It's difficult to keep their populations up because of how um, small of a number but how long they live is actually okay. So that's pretty good. They live to be 30 to 40 years old. They live a long time. Put up bat houses. Planting wildflower gardens are going to help birds, bats, bees, and butterflies. You're going to give them safe places to eat, especially pesticide-free. And teaching your friends that bats, not only are bats cool, but bats consume large numbers of insects, they pollinate plants, they spread seeds, they're dying off and we have to do something now. So please join the Save the Bats campaign and together we can help make the planet healthy for us. Remember, bats make it healthy for us and for bats. And so we brought some live bats to show you. We've got about 200 live bats at the Organization for Bat Conservation's Wildlife Sanctuary. And the first one that Ava's bringing out is a straw-colored flying fox. It is the, uh, one of the largest bats in uh, Africa. Oh, and he's going to the bathroom all over the carpeted area right over there. Ho <laughs> Hopefully there... Hopefully there isn't going to be like uh, tumbling and stuff right there. Um, why don't you go ahead and put them up on there? <laughs> Not till Saturday, we'll get it cleaned. Um, so the straw-colored fruit bat is a bat from Africa. It's, it's the largest bat with the largest wingspan in, on the continent of Africa. It has about a three-foot wingspan. How you doing, buddy? You want to come over here? Come here. You want to go grab his, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I have some fruit right here. So let's see if we can get him to move a little bit. Uh, the straw-colored flying fox, here we go. Ready? <laughs> oh, yeah, he's really interested. They're incredibly food-motivated. 
<laughs> I couldn't even jam it in his mouth. Come on. All right, let's move, move, him, uh, move him around, Ava, and see if he'll do a little stuff. See if we can get him to flap his wings. There we go. Now he's going. Yay. Oh, all right. And he tried to take off. There he goes. All right, let's bring, <laughs> let's bring him back up. The bats that live at the Organization for Bat Conservation are injured, uh, elderly. Um, they've been accidentally, a lot of times, held as pets. So people sometimes have them as pets. We end up getting them because uh, they, they can't be let go into the wild. This guy here has been with us for many, many years. The straw-colored flying fox is a beautiful, uh, has a beautiful color. Uh, he's being awfully uh, fussy today. But in the wild, this species is incredibly important for both pollination and seed dispersal. So across the continent of Africa, this bat migrates over a thousand miles. And as it migrates, bats, as you can kind of see here, <laughs> go to the bathroom in flight. And so they fly and spread seeds. They spread the seeds 50 to 90 percent of a uh, cleared rainforest, the seeds are brought in by bats. All right, let's go ahead and put uh, the straw-colored flying fox away. And I have now a local bat that I want to show you. The local bat I'm going to take out is a, it's called a big brown bat. And the big brown bat is one of our North American bats. And believe it or not, our bats in North America are quite small. I'll see where we are right here. There we go. We're going to bring them in. There we go, nice and close. All right. So we've got micro bats and we have mega bats. And the mega bats are those large bats with large eyes. They have a large body. The micro bats have tiny eyes. They have huge ears. And they use echolocation. Now, I'm going to give him a little something to eat, like you saw when I, was, uh, when I was on with Conan. Let's see if he's a little hungry here. Oh, everybody's hungry today. <laughs> are you hungry at all? Not at all, are you? Not yet, huh? Okay. Uh, I'm going to real gently stretch out one of his wings so you could take a look at it. So the bat's wing is a lot like our hand. They have four long fingers. And in between each one of the fingers is very thin skin. If you want to know how that wing feels, just close your eye and touch your eyelid. Touch the skin that covers your eye. That's exactly the way a bat's wing feels. Now, another neat thing that you're starting to see there is he's echolocating. He's giving off ultrasonic sounds. And if I turn on this bat detector, it's called an, uh, an echo meter. And it picks up the bat's ultrasonic sounds, and it translates them into a sound that we can hear. Now I'm going to move the bat around. So what you're seeing on the screen right there is the bat's echolocation. And what you're hearing, let's see, there we go. What you're hearing is the bat's echolocation. So as the bat's flying around at night, it's able to tell a single strand of hair just by listening to its echoes. As scientists, a professor from Harvard in the 1930s discovered that you can use electronic devices to hear a bat's echolocation. Well, we cannot see the bats very well at night, just like you can't, even though we're bat experts. But we can see it now with echolocation, with electronics, with technology, we now have learned so much more about bats over the years. Let's go ahead and see if, we'll, see if he's hungry now. Now that he's woken up, we'll get a close-up shot. And there we go. Are you hungry now? <laughs> Not with all those people staring. Are you sure? All right, by the way, his name is Radar, and Radar is having none of it. <laughs> But he does enjoy echolocating right now at this point. One more echolocation. 
All right, we depend on these bats because they consume such large numbers of insects. This is a bat that actually eats more beetles than most other bats do. And it eats June bugs that destroy your, uh, destroy your lawns. It also eats a lot of the beetles that are invasive species, exotics, that have come here to the United States. Uh, the, mount, my, the mountain pine beetle and the emerald ash borer beetles. Those beetles are causing a lot of problems for our trees. And these little bats right here are helping to, to uh, get rid of them. We've got one last bat to show you. The last bat is the largest bat in the entire world. It's a Malayan flying fox. And the Malayan flying fox is going to the bathroom as well. <laughs> Why don't I go ahead and uh, get the shower? All right, here we go. There we go. All right. This is Fred, by the way. Fred is, uh, is the largest species in the world. The Malayan fly... Oh, that feels good. I'm warm. So he's... <laughs> oh, and you can hear that, too. That's not his echolocation. That's his wingspan. He's a strong bat. Well, Fred is about 18 years old, and he does have a wing that's uh, been permanently injured. He injured his wing many years ago. Unfortunately, he can't fly. He was born in a zoo. He became a great ambassador for bats. He really enjoys being brought out, as you can see, and uh, carrying them around. He really likes to be brought out and to check people out. The largest bats in the world have up to a uh, six-foot wingspan. Are you ready, Fred? There we go. And what I'd love for you to be able to see is how they use their uh, thumbs and they use their feet. Now, Fred, let's see if you're hungry. You want to come over this way? There we go. Keep coming. <laughs> okay, here you go. Oh, thank you. Fruit bats eat two and a half times their body weight in fruit every single night. They also go to the bathroom a lot. And so as they fly across the rainforest, they spread seeds. He, I think he might be enjoying seeing himself up there. Either that or he's concerned of the giant bat. <laughs> oh, look at that. There we go. Oh, nice. So they don't, they don't eat all the fruit. They chew on the fruit. They spit out the pulp. They spit out the seeds. They don't want to weigh their bodies down. And then they're primarily just drinking the juice. That's why bats eat so much. Because they just need the energy to keep flying. If you ever see something flying at night, flap, flap, glide, that's a bird. If it's always flapping, that's a bat. Unfortunately, we see a lot less bats around today. I was talking to someone earlier today from New York. They see a lot less bats around. So that's a great shot. Look at that. So cool. So I hope that after uh, this presentation that you find, I don't know if you love bats now. Some of you do. I know. I talked to you guys already. Did he spit it out yet? No, not yet. He's getting really close. I hope a lot of you now really like bats at least. You're going to go home. You're going to teach your friends. You're going to plant a garden, and you're going to put up bat houses. You're going to join the Save the Bats campaign. Thank you so much. Shall I leave him up for the rest of the presentations? <laughs> he wants to. <laughs> so beautiful. There we go. Okay. La last marking. Go ahead. Don't let him pee on me. 